Uh, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to Angus for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Alan for kicking us off with such a great uh, set of slides, and to uh, Rama and Elisa. Elisa, it's really great to see work you started at the bank uh, <laughs> yeah, it really uh, coming, coming to um, coming to fruition. So well, well done. Uh, and Rama, I realise I'm pestering you constantly at the minute, so I apologise uh, uh, for that. But that actually is a signal about how seriously we take these issues. Um, I'm supposed to be, I think, according to the agenda, the policy challenger. I fear I may just be about to become the policy agreer uh, with everything that's been said. Uh, because actually, I think we're moving into a phase of financial stability analysis and practice now, the third phase after the financial crisis, that really is about all of these issues and about, in my, to my mind, simulation. So you think about the first phase after the crisis as stabilization, the second phase as fixing the fault lines that were so obviously kind of exposed by the crisis. We've made the system safer, put more capital into the banking and liquidity into the banking system. We've made it simpler by stripping out some of the complex webs of interconnections in derivative markets and interbank exposures. And uh, as Elisa says, we've introduced bail-in regimes to make the system fairer uh, as well and remove the kind of heads I win, tails you lose nature of risk taking that we saw in the run up to, to the crisis. But the third phase, and the one that we're in now, I think, is really about system dynamics and asking whether the system works for the economy. And to do that, we have to simulate because we're no longer fighting the last war, we're no longer repairing the fault lines that caused the crisis. And if the crisis showed anything, it's that it's really bad in financial stability practice to build a body of empirical evidence. The last thing you want is a repeated financial crisis. The last thing you want is a body of empirical evidence. So how do you approach this problem? Well, you simulate. You ask the question, what if? What if something went wrong? Uh, and Elisa had some really good Ben Bernanke quotes. My own Ben Bernanke quote uh, is that in response to the question, so Mr. Bernanke, the first rule of a financial crisis is not to have one. So what went wrong? He thought about it and he said, you know, the problem was we spent too much time asking whether there was a housing bubble and not enough time asking, suppose there is, mm -hmm. what happens then? And we would have spent much more time working through the dynamics of the system. We would have maybe found the trigger points, the thresholds and the fault lines. In other words, I take that to be we didn't spend enough time simulating the system assuming something's gone wrong. There was too much argument about whether anything would go wrong and not enough time spent saying, just suppose, just suppose it does. What happens then? And that's why I think simulation is so important. The other key feature of this phase, I think, of financial stability work is to take the macro perspective and to put the macro into the pru bit of macro credential. For the reason that the financial system exists to serve the economy, it doesn't exist for its own purposes. And if we could build an entirely safe financial system with no risk taking at all, that'd be pretty rubbish for the economy. We could build a system with all the individual bits very safe, but actually had a ton of fragility in it. That would be rubbish for the real economy as well. So for my, to my mind, all of this work has to be about simulation and it has to be done from the perspective of the real economy rather than the financial system uh, itself. And I'll say a little bit about how we are thinking about that, building on uh, Elisa and Rama's um, great presentations to do so. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about banks and in particular bail-in and resolution. I'll say a little bit about non-banks uh, and then I'll try and bring it together in what Rama calls stress testing 3.0. Um, so on the banking front, uh, I think Elisa's presentation is great. It gets to the heart of what the kind of key parameters are in a bail-in. To my mind, it actually shows us, first of all, why bail-out is so bad. It's not just that it's horribly unjust and unfair, the people who take the risks don't bear the consequences. It's actually that it's very bad from a macro perspective. Why? Because number one, the politics means that bail-outs happen very late. They definitely don't happen when a bank hits its minimum capital requirements. You're lucky if they happen when a bank has run out of book capital. The second reason bailout doesn't work for the economy is because the politics means you don't tend to recapitalize a bank to a very high level of capitalization. RBS is a great example uh, yeah. of this. Uh, and the third reason it doesn't work is the rules of a bailout are never very clear. 
Uh, so bailout, I think, is you've shown or could show with this work is actually a very, very bad method of dealing with a failing bank from the perspective of the economy. And it's why, um, incidentally, in the Swedish, uh, the Scandinavian financial crisis in the early 90s, bailouts worked. This is probably the only example I've seen of a bailout working from the perspective of the economy because it was decisive, it was early and it was big. And those are very rare characteristics of a bailout. And they are, in fact, your primary parameters, <laughs> uh, I think. So generally, you know, the politics means that bailouts don't work for, for the economy. Bail-in completely agree that the parameters are crucial. And just, while, just allow me to enter defensive mode for one second. Uh, actually, in the UK regime, um, we expect to resolve a bank at its minimum capital requirements. The amount of bail-in debt, so long-term, not short-term debt, that banks are required to hold is sufficient to recapitalize them, not just to their minimum requirements, but well above. And we've clarified recently that we would intend in a bail-in to just bail in the whole lot to the best form of capital for that very reason. Uh, and those two things together mean actually that we are sort of meeting your first two, or our intention is to meet your, your, at least your first three parameters. But I think it's worth exploring further, and especially, particularly in a systemic crisis, what other parameters are there that could be improved upon. But the reason we've got there is because people like Elisa are simulating, so what happens if a bank fails and you need to bail it in, rather than just assuming that the problem is solved. Um, the second area with banks, I think, when, you, when you, we shift to simulating and the, and the perspective of the economy, is the role of buffers, buffers of capital and liquidity. Huge post-crisis reform has been to raise bank capital levels, raise liquidity levels, to try and fix the fault line behind the financial crisis. But those buffers are no good if they are unusable by the banks that hold them. If they're untreated as unusable, they are to some extent a deadweight loss. What's absolutely crucial is that capital buffers can be drawn down as banks make losses, so they don't, have, they don't try and protect their balance sheets and rein in and create a credit crunch, and similarly with liquidity buffers uh, as well. So stress testing isn't, stress testing 1.0 as Rama calls it, isn't really enough. It tells you whether a bank has enough capital to survive a shock, or, and at least maybe it tells you it has the capacity to keep lending in a shock, but it doesn't tell you that it will keep lending in a shock. And that's why it's really important to try and simulate with the banking sector, well, suppose there is a downturn in the economy, how, what's your reaction function? What, is, what happens as your capital buffer is eroded through losses? How much do you rein in and what are the knock-on effects of that for the economy and the rest of the financial system? And we are now... Uh, building models, at least it was there when we were starting out on this track, to uh, try and explore, even with lots of safe banks, what does an economic shock do, or how is an economic shock turned into an economic scenario by the behaviour of those banks as their capital ratios are eroded. And that's a shift away from, if you like, micro stress testing to macro stress testing. And right now, we have in train an exercise with the banking system on their liquidity buffers as well. This has been a big innovation since the crisis, build up levels of liquidity, mainly so that banks have some skin in the game when it comes to liquidity risk. But it's not clear that those buffers are treated by banks as buffers. They may be treated by the market uh, and by banks as kind of hard minima. And that's problematic in the event of a funding run because it means banks defend their balance sheet, rein in, stop providing liquidity to markets, they cut back on repo activity, they cut back on dealer inventory, and all of a sudden, market liquidity dries up, just as it did in the crisis, even though banks have lots of liquidity, lots of liquid assets. That would be a bad macro outcome. So the exercise we're currently undertaking with the banks is not a pass-fail stress test. It's a simulation, and it asks the question, well, suppose you, had a fund, you all had a funding run, a systemic funding run. We're not even going to bother arguing about why. We're just going to say, this happens. Now let's collectively work through the consequences. And let's, as Rama hinted earlier, importantly, let's do this in more than one round. Let's see what everybody does in round one. Then let's add it up, give you all the knock-on effects of that, and let's run it again. So in effect, it's like a war game exercise. Where we want to come out with this exercise is, one, some assessment of how, given their current reaction functions, this could work. But most importantly, it's two, 
It's some collective understanding between banks, supervisors and central bank, which would be a liquidity provider in this scenario, about the reaction functions of the others so that you can achieve a better macro outcome if this event ever were to happen. And our key concern is to make sure liquidity buffers are treated as usable and our liquidity provision facilities are also treated as open and, and usable as well. Those two things are going to be crucial in making sure that a hypothetical liquidity stress can, be, can happen without traumatic consequence for the real economy uh, rather than just having you know, safe banks. Banks that look very safe because they've got lots of liquid assets but are actually very dangerous for the rest of the economy. And I think that exercise shows how seriously now we've moved into this next phase to move on from, if you like, individual bank safety to what does this whole regime mean for the safety of the financial system from the perspective of the economy. So that's banks. Uh, let me say a little bit about non-banks and then I'll talk about the system as a whole and stress testing 3.0 as Rama calls it. So non-bank, one of the big shifts we've seen in the last 10, 15 years since the financial crisis is a, is a transformation of financial activity away from the banking system towards the non-bank system. Um, and I say non-bank as truly not banks. I don't mean shadow banks. I mean things that are not doing short-term liquidity and credit transformation. Things like mutual funds, insurance companies, pension funds. Now, pound for pound, that shift is great for financial stability. Having a huge, concentrated, leveraged banking system as the core of your financial system is not the best plan for financial stability. So a, diver a more diverse system is a better system. But we are uh, perfectionists. So the question we're asking ourselves is, are the, is this non-bank financial system safe from the perspective of the economy? Now, it's definitely safe from the perspective of its own kind of balance sheet. If you're a mutual fund and you take a loss, a mark-to-market loss, the losses are all on your investors. Uh, if you're... Um, but, but there's a question about what those fund structures mean for the wider financial system and the rest of the economy. A lot of the uh, growth of the non-bank sector since the crisis has been the shift in um, financing structures, particularly for the corporate sector, away from bank loans and towards bond issuance. And the holdings of those bonds have largely gone into open-ended mutual funds. In those funds, the market risk is borne by the investors. But there is a fault line in those funds, which is that they're offering daily redemption, your money back at a day's notice, but at a market price. And if you redeem, though, and the fund is forced to sell your holding at one day, it is, in some circumstances, unlikely to realise that market price. So you don't want to be the person left in the fund. You want to be at the front of the queue. So even without a banking sector balance sheet, you can create a run dynamic, or at least an incentive to be front, in front of the other person in the queue. And that makes, if you get that run dynamic, the funds become four sellers. They become fire sellers of the assets. They, in effect, create the scenario. So you get a shock, creates an incentive to be ahead of the, uh, ahead of the other people in the queue to redeem. The fund faces redemption pressure. To, re to meet those redemptions, it has to sell the assets pretty aggressively. <coughs> That can drive down market prices, tighten funding conditions for the corporate sector, change the economic scenario, and so you enter a feedback loop. And that's why, even though these funds look, from a micro perspective, entirely safe, as a macro prudential authority, now with the FCA, we are looking very hard at what can be done to change the structures of these funds and the incentives their investors face, <coughs> effectively by aligning the redemption terms, the price and the time, with the liquidity of the assets. And all of this is from the perspective is being done, not because there's an empirical point that says these things have been a problem in the past, but because simulations can show that they might be a problem in the future. And it's better to sort it out before it actually happens. And these things can, these issues can, with funds can also could in principle also be exacerbated by and Rama touched on it margin calls on derivative positions. Um, derivatives, the, the fund might say, well, I've got this derivative position actually as a hedge. It means my value at risk is much lower. But then you say, well, okay, what happens when you get a margin call on that fund? 
on that uh, derivative position, where are the liquid assets or the assets you will sell to meet that margin call? And are they liquid or, are, or will you be a fire seller of illiquid assets? Now, turns out you need vast amounts of data to assess this from trade repositories and such like. But we've had a go and we find it's not currently an issue. The derivative positions that funds have are not very large and where they are significant, they tend to have a stock of liquid assets that they could use to meet a margin call. But there's no guarantee that it will always stay that way. And so what we need in that area is at least measures we can monitor of the thing that matters, which isn't value at risk, as Rama hinted at. It's um, kind of liquidity at risk. What's the possible margin call you might face on any given day? And what's your buffer of liquid assets to meet that? And therefore, what sort of fire sale pressure might I expect you to be exerting on markets in a market stress? All of that, again, is not about measuring the risk, the value at risk of an individual balance sheet, which may be very low. It's about measuring the knock-on effects and simulating the knock-on effects <coughs> through the system of something that individually looks very safe. So let me draw that together um, into how banks and non-banks might come together in the, the whole financial system. And this is really crucial, I think, and it goes to Rama's uh, stress testing 3.0. Um, at its heart. I think the, the, the key to the next phase of financial stability analysis and practice actually is to, be, is to simulate, try and simulate the whole financial system, which sounds like a big ende endeavour. It's going to require vast amounts of data, new modelling techniques, um, and frankly policy makers getting to grips with it. Uh, but that is no counsel for despair. In fact, it sort of makes it even more important that we get on with it and start. And uh, the good news is we have. So we have started to build agent-based models of the different sectors of the economy and how they might work together in a stress. And in, the way I characterize it, consistent with Rama's uh, presentation, is to say well, you, you don't put a scenario in. It's the, the scenario is what comes out of these things. You put a shock in and then you see how everything works through. And the important point about these models is not, as Elisa said, you don't have, we don't have the calibration precise enough yet, but they are tools to aid our thinking about what might matter in the financial system. What parameters, in the same way as Elisa's done, really matter for the safety of the whole system? And what parameters matter for how the system translates a shock into a scenario? So our agent-based models, and for anyone who's interested, it's the um, Bank of England working paper 809, um, put together insurance companies and pension funds, uh, clearing houses, commercial banks, dealer banks, derivatives market, a repo market with hedge funds, and ask, well, what if we, we're going to mess around with the constraints these people operate under, and we're going to shock the thing and just see what happens and work it through. And this is an ongoing program of work. I think this, mod this model is no way perfect, but it is, I think, a platform for us to build on because it will allow us to build in more complex models of individual sectors uh, and put them in over, t over time. And the key thing that comes out of this, I think, it's kind of obvious when you look at it, but <coughs> is that if you put a shock into a system like that in which every individual node is safe, it's got loads of capital, it's got loads of liquidity, or it's passing on the risk to its investors, uh, you can create some very serious dynamics because of the constraints the individual actors are under. And so just think about you know, a credit shock in markets. Um, all of a sudden, market volatility has gone up. Dealer banks uh, try and reduce their inventory, so they step back from the corporate bond market. They, their capital falls because of mark-to-market accounting. They rein in on their repo activity because they want to shrink their balance sheet because their capital position is being depleted. The hedge funds, who were suppliers of liquidity, now rein in because they can't get repo funding, so they've stepped back. And the insurance companies and pension funds, although there's a real buying opportunity in the sense that market prices are being driven down, actually also step back because their value at risk measures have gone up. And so you can very easily create, with a small shock, uh, a jump to illiquidity in a core funding market for the real economy. And you can do that in a situation where every single player in the simulation is entirely safe. Uh, and that's, in a sense, the core to the next phase of work here. It's to 
try and assess the, the optimal design of regulations in particular in each of these areas so that it's not just the individual bits that look safe, but that the system as a whole works for the real economy in a stress. Uh, so I don't have a council of despair. I'm quite optimistic about the fact that we've already moved into this area thanks to research from many people in this room and elsewhere. I'm really keen to keep it going. I'm really pleased that you're having this dialogue. Uh, and I hope we can continue to push forward into this territory for which there is no playbook. Um, and long may it stay that there isn't an empirical fact base either. Thanks very much. <laughs>